Welcome to Battle Creek, where we continue, continue our 11th hour evidence seminar. It all begins tonight with our friend Buddy Hotelling and his song, A Hands on God. There was nothing at all when he came and he called all the let there be And there was light, there was air Trees and stars everywhere He was so well pleased Birds of every color Fish of every size Animals abound in all spoken well He is the way with words But there was nothing to say As he molded the clay His lips they fell silent because He loved them too much Just to speak not to touch He's a hands-on God And he just couldn't bear Not to hold, not to care He's a hands-on God The joy of their creator The image of his dad So much more than just some breath inside they were the children of a hands-on God. He could have run from the room when she poured the perfume on her Savior. Could have taken a seat instead of washing the feet of the twelve of them. He could have gone right back to heaven when they shouted crucify, pulled his hands away from that old cross. But he loved us too much to deny us that touch. He's a hands-on God And he just couldn't bear Not to hold, not to care He's a hands-on God Still the joy of our Creator The image of his dad So much more than just some breath and song the children of a hands-on God, still the children of a hands-on God. Thanks, buddy. We really appreciate your gift in music. Friend, I want to try a little bit of a quiz with you folks tonight here. And with you out there in the watching audience of 3ABN, here, here's how the quiz goes. You ready for a quiz? I want you guys to put on your thinking caps. I got my degree in history, so this is a little bit easier for me than it might be for you. Can you tell me right now, who was the most powerful man, here's a hint, the emperor of the world, the, the Roman world, in AD 27. Anyone able to tell me that tonight? Nobody knows. I heard somebody say Augustus. Actually, the right word is Tiberius. The right name is Tiberius Caesar. Can anyone name his mom? Mmm. I'm not getting any takers on it. Her, her mom, his mom's name was Olivia. Can anybody name for me his three closest friends? 
Again, nobody. I'm not even going to try that one, David. Can anyone tell me something famous that he said? Again, nobody. Hey, this is the most powerful man in the world, folks. How come you know so little about this person who was the ruler of the known world in AD 27? Let's, let's try a different one. Let's try a different one. What do you say? Let's go to a backwater region of the Roman world. Let's say Judea, okay? And let's go to a backwater region of Judea. Let's try, for instance, Nazareth. Let's uh, go to a backwater part of Nazareth, a carpenter shop. And now I want to ask, do you know anybody that's working in a carpenter shop in AD 27 in Nazareth? Hmm, that's just pretty good. Do you know his mother's name? Do you know his father's name? Do you know three of his closest friends? Can you repeat anything famous that he said? Of course you can, right? What do you think you are? How do you know so much about a guy from a backwater carpenter shop in Nazareth and so little about the man who is the ruler of the known world? That, my friends, is a miracle. That is one of the miracles that makes me believe that Jesus Christ is alive tonight. Not yet convinced? Well, my friends, I'd like to introduce to you tonight's speaker, David Ashrick, who will take us a step closer to believing that God loves us, that he's alive, and that Jesus is is the name. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Did anybody here know Caesar Tiberius's mother's name? I'm glad he didn't ask me that question publicly. How was your day today? Did you have a nice Sabbath? Yeah. Amen. I want to thank Buddy again for that song. Wasn't that beautiful? Yeah. I love those songs. They're so, they're so rich, not just in the melody, but in the lyrics. Thank you, Buddy. God has definitely given you a gift. All right, we have a, a significant amount of information to cover tonight. Our message is entitled, Does God Exist? Does It Matter? Does God Exist? Does It Matter? And because we have such a stupendous amount of information to cover tonight, and we want to make an earnest appeal to you at the end of this, we're going to begin right away by praying, and I invite you to do that with me as we commence. Father in heaven, we come just tonight and we marvel that we knew so little and still know so little of Caesar Tiberius and yet, Father, we know so much of Thee. And Lord, we come to You tonight praying that in a very special way, in a marked way, that You will speak directly to our hearts and to our minds. Father, we live in a world in which many people are doubting Your existence and questioning whether or not You are even there and yet, Father, You are so near, so there. And tonight we ask that you please will come into this room, that you will speak to our minds as well as to our hearts, and Father, that we will have a stronger conviction that this is in fact the eleventh hour, and there is a considerable amount of evidence to buttress that assertion. Father, this is the eleventh hour. As we turn now to your word and to your spirit, may you give us evidence, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite you to go with me in your Bibles to a very interesting text found in the book of Psalms. What book are we going to, everyone? Psalms. Psalms, right in the middle of your Bible. Psalms. And we're going to go to chapter 14. Psalm 14. And beginning in verse 1. Psalm 14, beginning in verse 1. Our message tonight is entitled, Does God Exist? Does It Matter? What we're going to do this evening is divide our message into two parts. You notice that the message is put in, in the form of an interrogative. It is not a declarative. God exists and it matters. It is in the form of an interrogative. Does God exist? That is the first question. And the second is the logical rejoinder. Does it matter? So we're going to divide the message tonight into two parts. The first half, or probably about the first 30 minutes, we will spend looking at that question, does God exist? And we're going to look at some of the classical, philosophical, and even theological proofs for God's existence. We're going to talk about science tonight, and so you'll need to take your thinking caps and put them firmly on your heads. You're not afraid to think, are you? I said, you're not afraid to think, are you? No. So that'll be the first half of the message, does God exist? Then what we're going to do is we're going to ask a very practical question. If it is, in fact, true that God does exist, then what, what practical application would that have for you and I in the here and now? Does it matter? How does it matter? And why does it matter? So number one, does God exist? And number two, does it matter? You're in Psalm 14, beginning in verse 1, and we find this very interesting passage of Scripture. Psalm 14, beginning in verse 1. 
It says, The fool has said in his heart... What does the fool say in his heart? There is no God. Friends, that's the classic uh, synopsis of atheism. That's the two words, A, which is the negative, and theos, which is God. So when you are talking about an atheist, you're talking about somebody who does not believe in the existence of God. And notice right here at the beginning, God says, those who don't believe in me are fools. Now, God is not uh, uh, just simply calling names, you know, uh, nanny, nanny, boo-boo kind of a thing. God is saying that the person that claims that there is no God has made a foolish proposition, a foolish statement. And so he says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He continues, they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. The picture that I have in my mind as I read this passage of Scripture is one of God looking down to investigate the intellectual claim of the atheist who says with such pride, there is no God. He positively asserts that there is no God. And so God looks down from, from heaven. He leans over from the celestial realms and he is evaluating the claim of this atheist. And the first thing he says is, the man is a fool. He then goes on to say, or the woman is a fool. He goes on to say that their, their denunciation of me, their lack of belief in me is not an intellectual consideration. What is he talking about at the rest of verse 1 and 2 and 3? These are all moral considerations. They're all what word did I say? Look at it again. Notice verse 2. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men. He's investigating the claim that there is no God. Perhaps there is evidence to suggest that God doesn't exist. So God is leaning over to see if the evidence is good. He says, to see if there is any who does not seek, or if there are any who seek God, verse 3, they have all turned aside, they have together become corrupt, there is none who does good. No, not one. So God's evaluation of the claim that there is no God as being a foolish claim is simply this. He is saying that when somebody makes that positive affirmation that God does not exist, the atheistic affirmation, he is saying that this is not an intellectual consideration. This is a moral consideration. It is a what word did I say? In other words, they want to live the way they want to live and God gets in the way of their perversities and promiscuities. And so they, they find it's much easier just to say, well, God doesn't exist. After all, if He does exist, we would have to give an answer and a response to the supreme being of the universe. Are you understanding now? Yes or no? Now, what I'd like to do is invite you to turn your attention to the screen. Our message is entitled, Does God Exist? Does it matter? The Bible does not set out to prove God's existence. It simply declares His existence. In other words, the Bible does not set out to say, God exists and here is the syllogistic proof. Here is the mathematical proof. Here is the scientific proof. It simply declares that He exists. In fact, what are the first four words in the canon? What are the first four words in the Bible? In the beginning, God. Notice, not a proof of God, but a declaration of God. Genesis 1.1. Now, continue with me here. There have been classically 20 lines of evidence that have been uh, advanced to prove God's existence. Uh, these are philosophical proofs and theological proofs and scientific proofs. The combined weight of these apologetic proofs present a formidable and convincing case. Now, I want you to hone in on that word apologetic there, that word apologetic. Do any of you remember that word from last night? How many of you remember? Remember 2 Peter or 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15? Peter said, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready, how often? Always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, what was that word there that was translated to give an answer? Do you remember? It was apologia. That's exactly right. The word means to give an answer, to give a reason, to give a defense. And so classically, when, when philosophers and, and uh, uh, theologians and, and others have sat down to try and prove the existence of God, they have advanced approximately 20 lines of evidence. Now, we don't have time, of course, to go into all 20 of those. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at eight of them. The first is the case from the beginning of life. The case from the beginning of life. This is what is referred to by biologists as biogenesis. Biogenesis. Now, this is very easy to understand. 
It is simply two words put together in juxtaposition. The first word is bios or bio. The word means life. What does the word mean, everybody? Life. life. So you have the study of biology. That's the study of living things. Now, what does the word Genesis mean? means the beginning. So if we put these two words together, life and beginning, the word biogenesis simply means the beginning of what, everyone? Life. life. Now, I have a son. He's two and a half years old. His name is Landon, and he's becoming increasingly curious and aware of the world around him. And he will occasionally ask interesting questions of me, and I'm just waiting for the day when he asks this question. Papa, where did I come from? Now, that will be very easy to answer. I'll say, well, you came from mommy and daddy, and that will probably satisfy him for all of about six months. And then that mind's going to continue to work, and the synapses are firing, the neurons are connecting. And a little while later, he's going to say, um, Papa, where did you and mommy come from? Oh, that's an easy one to answer. We came from our mommy and daddy, and that might satisfy him for all of about six minutes. Well, where did they come from? Where did they come from? Where did they come from? And sooner or later, my son is going to have a very big question, where did Adam and Eve come from? Now, you might think that this is just a childish kind of question, that this is so easy, but friends, listen. This whole idea of biogenesis, the beginning of life, puts our finger on the pulse of one of the profoundest, most powerful proofs that God exists. And the law of biogenesis basically says this, life only comes from life. Say that with me. Life only comes from life. Now, there was a day back in, in the Dark Ages, in, in, in centuries past, where they believed that if you had a pile of garbage in the corner, that if you left that pile of garbage there long enough, it would spontaneously produce rats and mice and maggots and insects. But a man by the name of Louis Pasteur, does that name mean anything to you? Have you ever looked on the side of your juice container and it says what? Pasteurized. Louis Pasteur took sterile garbage, if there is such a thing, he sterilized it, put it in a corner. He made sure it had no existent life in it, no eggs, no, no life could get in. And they waited and they waited and they waited. And did life ever come out of it? No. Why? Because life only comes from what, everyone? Life. Now go with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 3. In Luke chapter 3, this is what is referred to as a genealogy. And you know the genealogy. So-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. So let's pick this up in Luke chapter 3. How about verse 34? We'll begin there. Luke chapter 3 and verse 34. It says, The son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sarag, the son of Rao, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech. I'm in verse 37. The, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam. Notice this now. The son of God. Now, friends, this is very powerful, very sublime, because the Bible here in tracing this genealogy is actually giving a very potent and compelling scientific proof for the explanation of life on this planet. You see, friends, if God doesn't exist and there is no supernatural entity like the atheist suggests, the fool suggests, then they have to surmount this insuperable, this insurmountable obstacle that says this, life came from non-life. Yet, friends, can life come from non-life? No, it's a physical impossibility and every single biological experiment, every single scientific experiment since the dawn of science has proved that it is an impossibility for life to spontaneously generate from non-life. And so we go backward. Where did you come from? From mommy and daddy, from mommy and daddy, from mommy and daddy. And the Bible gives us a powerful, compelling answer to this question of biogenesis, the beginnings of life, the son of Adam, the son of what, everyone? God. So number one, tonight, are you living? Are there others that are living? Amen? So just in the, in the existence of life, we find a compelling proof for the existence of God. Notice number two, the case from the existence of things, including time itself. And this is referred to as the cosmological proof. Now, don't be afraid of those many syllables. It's simply the cosmos or the universe, the existence of the universe. And notice this can be stated classically in three short phrases. Number one, Everything that begins to exist has a what? Cause. Now think about something in this room that exists. What's something that exists? Do you exist, young man? 
Okay, did you have a cause? Okay, he, he demonstrates that that's true. How about that light uh, uh, stand over there? Does that light stand exist? Was there ever a time that it didn't exist? Okay, so something caused it to exist. Are you understanding? Yes or no? Now, how about this podium? Does it exist? Sure it exists. Was there ever a time that it didn't exist? Now, think about that for just a moment. In order for it to come into existence, a podium maker had to fashion it and form it and create it. Are you understanding? Yes or no? Everything that you can think of that exists at one time didn't and it came into existence with one exception. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, number one, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Number two, the universe itself began to exist. Was there a time that the universe itself didn't exist? The answer is yes. God created the universe. Who created the universe? God created the universe. We just saw that in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, what everyone? God. And God created the heavens and the earth. Now, notice number three here. Therefore, the universe has a cause, and that uncaused cause of all things is what everyone? God. The only thing in the universe that does not have a cause, the only thing in the universe that has eternally existed is God. Now, friends, I wish I had time to go into very potent scientific, philosophical, and even mathematical proofs, but this is a very potent and very powerful proof that God got the ball rolling. God started this thing, and without the existence of God, friends, nothing else in the universe could exist, not even time itself. Now, let us continue. Notice with me on the screen now, number three. We're looking at our eight proofs for the existence of God. Number three is the case from design in the universe. The case from design in the universe. That is what is referred to as the teleological proof. It comes from the Greek telos, which is design. Which is what, everyone? Design. design. Now, as you look around you, as you look at your own hands and as you look at the world around you and the, the perfect synchronicity and harmony with which it operates, do you see design in the world around you, yes or no? Let me give you a very good example of design in the universe. Take your hands and hold them up, just like this. Try and experiment. You see this thing right here? What do we call this? We call that a thumb. Try this experiment at home. Take that thumb and put it to your palm and tape it there. All right? Now tape it there and, and do it to the other hand too. You're going to have to have somebody help you because you won't even be able to tape the other thumb. Now what you'll have is you'll have eight fingers but no opposable thumb. Now, do you think that you'll be able to do much? No, just try doing anything right there. You know, I can't even pick up this clicker very easily. And if I wanted to click, I'd have to push it like this. You understand? Now, look at this for just a moment. The functionality of the hand increases exponentially when you add an opposable thumb. You understand that, right? So these fingers point this way, the thumb points that way, and now I can grab, I can open, I can twist, I can pick up. In other words, do you see design when you look at the hand, yes or no? Absolutely. Tremendous design. How about the eye? Does the eye exhibit the qualities of design? Even Darwin himself, the, the grandfather of evolutionary theory, who wrote the book Origin of Species in 1859, I have quotations on my files where he says, the contemplation that the eye would have evolved through micro-mutations, gradual changes, he said, made him sick to his stomach. Friends, the eye is such a, a beautiful construction. Think about these video cameras that are taping us even now. Think about, think about the sound boards and all of these technological gadgets. None of them can do even one one thousandth of what the eye can do, and yet it is contained in such a small package. It can focus immediately on something close and then quickly on something on the distant horizon. It can go to something, it can step into a room that is very dark and immediately the pupil expands to let in more light. And then if you walk out into the sunny, uh, the, the, the sunny day and the snow is on the ground so that there's great radiant light, what does the pupil do? Shrinks right down in just a moment. Friends, the eye can do what even the most advanced television cameras and photographic cameras can't even begin to do and yet it is all contained in a package about the size of a marble. Does that exhibit the qualities of design, yes or no? If you and I were walking through the woods and we stumbled upon a stone, we might just pick up that ordinary stone and say, you know, this is a stone. It's a nice looking stone. It has some nice curvatures. Maybe it would be good for skipping. But a stone in and of itself would not exhibit the qualities of design. You wouldn't look at a stone and say there's a stone maker necessarily. But if you and I were walking through the woods and let's say we found that clicker, 
You and I were walking through, and as we came along, we said, oh, look, a clicker. <laughs> so we pick up the clicker and we say, isn't that remarkable? Must have dropped out of a tree. Maybe there's a clicker tree here, right? <laughs> Friends, does this clicker exhibit the qualities of design? Well, it sure does. As a matter of fact, it has a nice little, uh, uh, I suppose this is a clip so I could put it on my belt if I'd like. There's a button here and even a little red light to let me know that the clicker's working. It's also conveniently sized to fit right into my hand. And so this clicker exhibits the qualities of what, everyone? So what do you automatically assume about the clicker? That it has a designer. And friends, look at the world around you. Look at your opposable thumb, the incredible intricacies of the eye, and even beyond that, the biosphere, the entire ecosystem, huge uh, numbers of galaxies, billions upon multiplied billions of galaxies, swirling through the universe at breakneck paces. A and all of this together, friends, indicates clearly God had a hand in this. There is a designer. And where you see design, you automatically assume there is a designer who was behind it. Amen? Amen. The atheist is at a total loss to explain design in the universe. And this is what is referred to as the teleological argument. Now notice with me number four. The case from a life-allowing universe. This is called the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle. Now, how many of you know what the word anthropos means? Anthropos. Okay, it means man. That's right. The study of anthropology is the study of man. For example, in Mark chapter 2 and verses 27 and 28, Jesus said, The Sabbath was made for man. And the word is anthropos. Mankind. Now, when we talk about the anthropic principle, please follow me very carefully here. In fact, let's go right to the screen. Modern cosmology has identified not less than 40 measurable characteristics of the universe. Notice as we continue. Each of these characteristics are fine-tuned to such a degree that moving even one of them in either direction, a, only a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percentage would make the existence of life, and notice this here, anywhere in the universe impossible. Now let me just give you a few of them here. I've, I've written some of these down and I want you to hear some of these. These are just a few of these 40 plus measurable characteristics. And keep in mind that if even one of these was off by a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percentage, it's not just that life would be impossible here on planet Earth, but that life would be impossible in the universe. We would live not in a life-sustaining universe, but in a life-prohibitive universe. Do you understand that? Yes or no? Now I'm going to come back to this in just a minute, but listen just to a, a few of these. Number one, a strong nuclear force constant. Number two, a weak nuclear force constant. Number three, gravitational force constant. Number four, electromagnetic force constant. Number five, the ratio of electromagnetic force constant to gravitational force constant. Number six, the ratio of proton mass to electron mass. Number seven, the ratio of protons to the number of electrons. Number eight, the mass density of the universe. Number nine, the size of the relativistic dilation factor. Number 10, the ratio of neutron mass to proton mass. You getting the feel for this? You want the other 47? You're right on time. You're, oh, yeah, sure, the size of the relativistic dilation factor. I'm with you, Pastor Asherick. <laughs> Friends, the point here is just this. When astrophysicists and cosmologists begin to measure the measurable and identifiable characteristics of the universe, they're noticing something very interesting. They're saying, wow, this entire universe, not just planet Earth, beloved, the whole universe is fine-tuned to such a degree that if you took even one of those measurable characteristics and scooted it just a bit this way, or eek, just a bit this way, life would be impossible in the entire universe. <coughs> now notice this, not from a biblical point of view, not from a Christian point of view, but strictly from a cosmological point of view, what cosmologists are saying is this, the conclusion of modern cosmology is that the universe appears to have had man in mind. Now say that with me, man in mind. In other words, it looks like the whole universe was set up on the anthropic principle, the mankind principle. The whole thing was put together in the same way that my wife and I put our bedroom together for our, our new little boy. We'd gone to the hospital. He'd been born. We had the room prepared. We had the crib there. Everything was in place. And if you walked into that room and you saw the pretty decorations and you saw the crib and you saw all of the accoutrements that went with the room, you would conclude this room has been designed for a baby. Are you understanding, yes or no? 
By the same token, cosmologists and astrophysicists, they look at the universe and they say, wow, the more we measure and the more fine-tuned that we find these characteristics are, we come to the conclusion that the universe was designed for God's babies, namely you and I. Now go with me in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 45. I appreciate the science of cosmology and astrophysics, but we could have saved them a whole lot of time if they would have simply gone to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. By the way, just as a, a little point, as an anecdotal point, many of the world's foremost cosmologists and astrophysicists are Bible-believing Christians. Did you know that? Many of the world's foremost cosmologists and astrophysicists are Bible-believing Christians because, friends, they can look out at the, at the cosmos, at the universe, and they can say, somebody is out there. Albert Einstein's favorite quotation was, God doesn't play dice with the universe. In other words, it's not just chance. Not everything just randomly put together. Somebody is behind all of this. Notice Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 18. I love this verse of Scripture. It says, For thus saith the Lord, who created the what, everyone? He created the heavens, who is God, who formed the, what's the next word? The earth and made it, who established it. And notice this last, these last two lines here. It says, who did not create it in vain. He didn't create it, what, everybody? In vain. The next line tells us why he did create it. Create it. it says, who formed it to be inhabited. Why did God create the heavens and the earth, everyone? To be inhabited. In other words, he put it together with man in mind. And that is exactly what modern cosmology and exactly what modern astrophysics is telling us. The whole universe appears to have had man in mind. Can you say amen? Incredible, brothers and sisters. Now let us continue. We've just gone through four. Number five is the case from universal morality, the axiological proof. It comes from the word axiom. Axiom is what is true. Now let's talk about that for just a moment. Universal morality. What is morality? Oh, come on. What's morality? Is that the way that we should live? Yes or no? Now, if I say that individual is an immoral individual, you are, you are understanding that to mean that he or she is living outside of the way that we believe they should live. Does that make sense? Yes or no? You have, you've heard, no doubt, for, of, uh, for example, of the moral majority. You've heard of that phraseology, haven't you? So when we're talking about morality, we're talking about a prescription, the way that people should live. Now, does the Bible have anything to say about morality, yes or no? God has given us ten great rules. And yes, I use that word. We don't like rules in this day and age, but they're rules, friends, that are for our own best good. What are those ten rules? The ten commandments. Not ten suggestions. Not ten, you know, pieces of advice and counsel. But ten what, everyone? Commandments. Now, these commandments form the core of morality. For example, is, is murdering wrong? Yes or no? Sure, because the seventh commandment says, Thou shalt not, what? Or that's the sixth commandment. Thou shalt not murder, is the sixth. The seventh commandment says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. So if somebody murders, we say that's an immoral act. If somebody commits adultery, say, we say that's an immoral act. Are you with me, yes or no? Now here's the point. Across the world, there are these threads. I want to emphasize this, and please be thinking with me. The world over, there are these threads of morality that go through, listen carefully now, every single culture. What words did I say? Every single culture. Now, you, you've probably heard the exact opposite. In the day and age in which we are living, this, this relativistic age and this pluralistic age, we are being told, well, you know, every culture is different. And what's okay in your culture might not be okay in this person's culture. And we have these absolutely ridiculous statements where we say things like, well, that's true for you, but it's not true for me. You ever heard anybody say that? Friends, listen, that's an affront to the English language. Something is not true for you and not true for me. It's either true or it's not true. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He was making an absolute, exclusive kind of a statement. 
Amen? Amen. So we don't say, well, Buddha's true for you, friend, and Jesus is true for me. Now, that might be the politically correct thing to say, but it's not an accurate thing to say. Are you understanding now, yes or no? Amen. Now, think about this. In every culture, is there a moral thread, a moral truth that runs through it all? In the age in which we're living, they say, no, no, no. The culture in Africa, their morals are so different than ours. And Asia, oh, their, their whole cultural social system is so different. And it is true that there are variations. There are what word did I say? But let me give you one of the most powerful moral threads that runs through every single culture that exists today, and that is this. There is no culture on the top side of the earth in which it is considered honorable and desirable and just to treat those with cruelty that have treated you with kindness. You follow that? Is there any culture where that's considered appropriate? No, 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 you can go to Asia, Africa, any of the seven continents. You won't find any culture that says that it's honorable to treat with cruelty and, and with despite the very ones who have treated you graciously. Amen? Yeah. Now think about that. That is a moral thread that runs through every single culture. Where did they get it from? They got it from the Ten Commandments. That's exactly right. Now let me just give you something here very interesting to think about. Does anybody in this room speak more than one language? Does anybody in this room speak less than one language? <laughs> anybody in this room speak two languages or more? Okay, good. Three? Three? That little boy speaks three languages? Incredible. Well, I heard, I heard this cute little anecdote. I think you'll appreciate it. And it goes like this. If you speak three languages, you're trilingual. If you speak two languages, you're bilingual. And if you speak just one language, you're an American. <laughs> Amen? Now think about this for just a minute. All of the languages the world over, all of the languages, so you're thinking about the, you know, our own, the English language, and then you have the Spanish language, one of the Latin languages, and then we go to Europe and we have the Slavic languages, the Germanic languages, also the Latin languages. Then we go up into like Asia and China and those languages, and then we go down to the Sanskrit languages of India and the world over the tribal languages of Africa, and then we go up into Indonesia and the Philippines and Japan. All of these different languages, can you think of even one thread that would run through all of those languages? Some thread, some commonality that every single language group shares? The answer is no. Absolutely not. You say, well, what's the significance of that? I don't understand. Precisely this, and please listen carefully. Language is arbitrary. Language is what word did I say? For example... We call this a podium. What do we call it? Podium. A podium. But could we, call, could we have called this carpet? Could we have called this carpet? Sure we could have. We, I could have said, I'm so glad that the carpet is, is clear tonight. I like clear carpets. Right? And you'd understand if that's what we assigned this word. We call this a speaker, but we could have just as easily called it a bird. Is that true? Yes or no? So friends, listen. Language is arbitrary. We assign language meaning. Are you understanding? That's why this culture calls this this, and this culture calls this this, and this language group calls this this, and there's no rhyme or reason much between the different language groups. Yet remarkably, even though there's no thread in the great languages of the world, there is still that moral thread. Every single culture, what does it tell us? It tells us that language is arbitrary, but morality is anchored in the character of God. Amen. Now friends, I stand by that. Morality is anchored in the character of God. God is the one who says what is right and wrong, what is fair, what is just, what is noble, what is good, what is magnanimous. How many of you have understood this contrast between no consistency, no commonality in the languages, and yet this one thread that runs through every culture? How many of you have understood the significance of that? Raise your hand then you have got your fingers wrapped around this thing called the axiological argument. God is a moral being and he calls upon us to respond to his moral law. Now number six here is the case from the historical proof of Jesus' resurrection. We are going to devote an entire evening to that, an entire message to the historical proof for the resurrection of Jesus Christ in just a few nights. So we're going to move over that one. Number seven is the case from the inspiration and consistency of the Bible. How many of you here this evening believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God? 
I believe that as well. Let me tell you something remarkable, though. The Bible would be the inspired Word of God whether or not you believed it. Amen? Now, what that means then is that the Bible is objectively true. It's not just true because you believe it's true. It actually is true. And we're going to devote an entire evening to going into the proofs, to the evidences, to the historical authentication of the Word of God. Most people simply accept the Bible as being the Word of God. We're going to show you in an entire evening why you can have historical, scientific, archaeological, and every other kind of confidence that this is, in fact, the inspired, inerrant Word of God. Amen? Amen. All right. So notice this one, our last one. Number eight, the case from your personal experience. And I want to undergird that. Your personal experience, that is the experiential proof. Friends, listen to me very carefully. If you have an experience with something, it is very difficult to convince you that that thing doesn't exist. For example, how many people in this room have ever been to Madagascar? Ever been to Madagascar, the island of Madagascar off the eastern coast of Africa? Anybody? That's funny. Every time I ask that, nobody has ever been to Madagascar, buddy. Interesting. Now, listen to this. How many of you believe that Madagascar exists? Oh, remarkably, every hand goes up. Well, this is interesting, isn't it? Not one of us has been there, yet we are all totally convinced that it exists. Now, imagine with me that you take a trip to Madagascar, and sure enough, here you are. You're in Madagascar, and you're enjoying it. I don't know if they have sandy beaches there or not, but let's just pretend they do. So you're on the sandy beaches of Madagascar, and you get a telephone call from your friend, and he says, hey, how are you? Say, oh, I'm doing fine. I'm enjoying it here in Madagascar. And then he says, or she says, what? You're in Madagascar. Madagascar doesn't exist. You would respond by saying something like this. What do you mean Madagascar doesn't exist? I'm here right now. I'm experiencing it. Are you understanding? Friends, listen. If you have a living, active, vital, dynamic relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with, with the God of, of the Bible, you have proof. You have what word did I say? Proof from your own experience that He exists and no one could ever take it from you. Amen? Amen? Brothers and sisters, it is important to grasp that. There are many today Christians, even Christians sitting in the pews, who don't have confidence that God is their God. They might say in some sort of ambiguous sense, yeah, God exists, or I believe in a higher power, or I'm spiritual, but they don't have a living, active, vital, dynamic relationship with that God themselves. But I want to tell you this evening, if you have a relationship with God for yourself, you have the internal confidence, the experiential confidence that He's not only a God, but He is your God, your Father, your Savior, and your friend. <laughs> And so, friends, we have presented to you eight lines of evidence, and we have given you, I believe, a very compelling case that God exists. Would that we had time to go into to many of the other evidences that, that prove this. Now, notice with me, the second part of our message this evening is, does it matter? Does it matter? Sure, somebody might say, okay, I concede, Pastor Ashrick, you have marshaled some evidence here, and I concede that, that probably God does exist, but what's the big deal? Friends, listen to me very carefully. Every person, we have been speaking to your mind. Now, now let me spend the last several moments speaking to your heart. Speaking to your what? Heart. heart. Every person in this room, in fact, every person outside of this room, every culture, every country, every philosophy, every world view, every single culture, social group, governmental agency that you can think of, all of these must answer four inescapable questions. Four inescapable questions. And I guarantee you that each of you sitting in this room tonight have wrestled with one or more, probably all, of these four questions. Friends, I want to tell you tonight, Christianity is a thinking man's religion. Amen? God, as we said last night, God did not come to disable men's minds. God came to set free the mind of man and to enable men's minds and women's too. Amen? Amen. That's why He came. Christianity is a religion that causes us to think. It not only causes us to feel, and I'm all for feelings, amen? 
I said, amen. amen. I'm all for feelings, but you can't have your whole life driven by emotions, your whole life driven by feelings. There must be some intellectual continuity there in order to keep us interested. Friends, the Bible is an intelligent book that speaks to intelligent people. And the God of the Bible is an intelligent God that created an intelligent people. Amen. Amen. Now, our minds are numb and dulled through sin. I freely admit this. But if we will surrender our powers and we will surrender our lives to the God of the Bible, we will find that our mind will broaden, that it will begin to see new horizons and new vistas, and the whole world will open to us, up to us in a way we had never seen before. Now, notice this. Four inescapable questions, origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Every single person on the top side of the earth and every person in history must wrestle with these four questions. Origin, where am I from? Meaning, why am I here? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Yes or no? Be honest. Sure you have. What about the third one there? Morality, how should I live? And number four, destiny. Where am I going? Friends, these are the very questions that the Bible sets out to answer. Let us begin by looking at number one. Where am I from? Go with me to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis, what chapter are we going to? Genesis chapter 2. And notice here in Genesis chapter 2, we find a very powerful statement, a very powerful verse that links us inexorably to the creative hand of God. I'm in Genesis chapter 2 and I'm beginning in verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Who formed man, everyone? God formed man. He's not the process and the result of some, you know, evolutionarily long ages, you know, microevolution, 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 amoeba to monkey to reptile. Boom! And all of a sudden you have man. The Bible says God made man. Can you say amen? That's what Buddy's song was all about tonight. Amen. He's a hands-on God, friends. Amen. 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 Now notice what it says here. It goes beyond that. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils. Notice the intimacy there. If you're going to breathe into somebody's nostrils, you have to get close. He's not a distant God. He's not a God that just spoke and we came into existence. That's what he did with the other things. I love that, that element in Buddy's song there where he said the other things, you know, were spoken to existence. But when it came time to create this creature made in his own image, he stooped down in the mud. He formed him out of the mud. And then in an intimate act, a powerful act, he leans forward and breathes into our nostrils the breath of life. And notice what it says. And man became a living being. No place for evolution here, friends. God made man in his own image. That answers question number one. Where am I from? The answer is you are from the hand of God, made in the image of God, to love God and know him and enjoy him forever. Amen. Amen. By the way, go with me from the first book of the Old Testament to the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, and we're going to verse 4. Matthew chapter 19, what verse, everyone? Now notice this, Jesus here is speaking. Who's speaking, everyone? Jesus. Jesus is speaking. And it says in verse 4, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? How did he make them at the beginning, everyone? Male, male and female. This is an obvious reference to the creation story. Verse 5, <laughs> And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man put separate. Do you know what Jesus is doing here? Jesus is endorsing the Old Testament creation account. If we were to bring Jesus onto the platform this evening, if, if he would condescend to come into this room and we were to ask him, we were to say, Jesus, do you believe in evolution? He'd say, I don't believe in evolution. That's not how my father creates. My father creates instantaneously. And he affirms here that when he made him in the beginning, he made him male and female. Jesus believed in Moses' account of instantaneous creation. Can you say amen? Yeah. Now, friends, evolution is at war with biblical creation. And we're going to talk about that in a future night. But question number one has been answered for us. Where am I from? I can remember seven years ago, almost eight years ago, I was in a cold room in Laramie, Wyoming. My whole life had apparently fallen apart and I was beginning to ask these kinds of questions and there was a pain in my soul and anguish in my soul, tears running down my cheeks and I thought, well, where am I from anyway? Now, do you think that the answer to that question will have significance on the way I'm going to live my life? 
Friends, if I think that I am just the descendant of some, you know, infinitely long, evolutionarily long ages of time and the descendant of some monkey, you think that might have an influence on how I live my life? Friends, if I'm descended from monkeys, I'm going to act like a monkey. But if I'm created in the image of God, by Him, to know Him, to love Him, and to enjoy Him forever, that is going to have a transformative effect on my life. How about number two? Why am I here? Why am I here? Who, who put me here and for what purpose? Go with me in your Bible to 2 Peter, toward the end of the New Testament. 1 Peter, rather. Toward the end of the New Testament, we're going to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter what chapter? 1 Peter chapter 2. If you find the book of James toward the end of the New Testament, the next book is 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm reading in verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. The Bible says, But you are a chosen generation. What kind of a generation? A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people. Why did you make us this way, God? That you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Why did God create us? So that we could proclaim His praises. The one who called us out of darkness, out of ignorance, into His marvelous light, friends. God created you so that you can know Him, so that you can love Him and enjoy Him forever. The God of the Bible is all about relationships. Friends, it is relationships that give life significance. It is relationships that give life meaning. Can you say amen? amen. There's no such thing as meaning in life apart from relationships. If you came to the end of your life and you were driving the best car and you lived in the biggest house and you had the most successful uh, company on, on, the, uh, on Wall Street, if you came to that position in your life and you didn't have children, you didn't have a loved one, you had no meaningful relationship, you have missed the whole purpose and significance and meaning of life. Friends, God created us to have a relationship with us. He, he created us so that we would show forth the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Now notice that question number two is, why am I here? And we've answered that question. We are here to glorify God, to know Him, and to show forth His praises. How should I live? How should we live? Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 15, in very simple language, easy to understand, even a child can grasp this. He said, if you love me, keep my what, everyone? Amen. Commandments. Does God have commandments? Amen. Friends, God has commandments. And there are ways that we ought to live. Amen. And there are ways that we ought not to live. God here rejects this idea of situational ethics. Well, you know, maybe murder is okay under certain circumstances. God rejects this out of hand. He simply says, Thou shalt not murder. And there's no fine print at the bottom of that. Amen. And yet right at the, at the heart of the law is, is love, friends. That's what Romans chapter 10 teaches us, that the fulfilling of the law is love. How should we live? By the two great golden rules. Do you know what those two rules are? Number one, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul. Notice that, your heart and your mind. Friends, when you become a Christian, you don't turn your mind off. Amen? That's what this series is all about. Are we going to speak to the heart? Of course, we're going to speak to the heart, but we must also speak to the mind. So many sermons that we hear today and, and even many of the books that are being published require you to turn your mind off and not on. Others are doing your thinking for you, friends, but we're to love God with all of our heart, amen, amen. and our mind and our soul. And Jesus said, the second commandment is like unto it. You say it with me, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Is that easy or difficult? Friends, listen, it's easy to love the ones that love you. Amen? Yeah. See, I love Pastor Jason Sieber. And when I get to heaven and I say, but Jesus, I, I loved Pastor Jason with all of my heart. I loved him as best as I could. He's going to say, big deal. Jason's easy to love. <laughs> you understanding? Yeah. What about all those un unlovely people, friends? What about the ones that are tough to love? God calls us to love them. What about that person who wronged you? You ever been wronged? You ever had somebody turn on you, stab you in the back, and everything inside of you just wants to ball up and get back at them, but God says, no, you love them. Amen. How should we live? Morality. And last but not least, where am I going? 
Friends, I'll tell you tonight where I'm going. Jesus was speaking to His disciples in John chapter 14 and He said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself that where I am, you may be also. Friends, do you know where we are headed? Do you know what our destiny is? Our destiny is heaven and eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, that speaks to the heart and it speaks to the mind. Each of these four questions powerfully answered. Does God exist? Of course He exists. Compelling evidence demonstrates that. Origin, meaning, morality and destiny. Origin, where am I from? Meaning, why am I here? Morality, how should I live in destiny? Where am I going? Friends, I'll tell you where I'm going. By the grace of God, I'm going to that kingdom. Amen. That celestial kingdom. I want to walk. I want to walk on streets of gold, but not by myself, friends. I want to walk with Jesus. Amen. How about you? As we close tonight, I want to ask two questions. Number one, has tonight's message been clear? Have you understood the message? If that is the case, raise your hand high to heaven. Amen. You've turned your mind on and you have understood. The second question is tonight, how many of you, how many of you want to make that full, total, and complete surrender of your life and your heart to Jesus Christ? Why don't you raise your hand? God bless you all. Friends, this is a decision you will not regret. This is the greatest decision you can make. And tonight I urge upon you to continue to live in that decision. That's my encouragement to you. God bless you all.